Once again, greetings culture lovers. Tonight is uh, really a special treat for me and I hope it will be for you because my guest is somebody who is not only an old friend and associate but one of the genuine talented movers and shakers of our business. Roy Thomas, editor emeritus of Marvel Comics and as good a writer as we're ever going to find anywhere in the comic business and maybe in any other business. Roy, it's uh, really a pleasure having uh, you tonight. Thanks up for the build-up, except for the old part. <laughs> well, I meant old in a uh, figurative sense, of course. You'll always okay. be Roy the boy to me. Right. How okay. old were you when you started at Marvel, Roy? Well, I'm informed by people in the industry I was an old man because I was uh, pushing 25, and almost everybody else, yourself included, that I know, uh, got in when they were teenagers. Yeah. Uh, but in the middle 60s, almost nobody had been getting into the field uh, for several years. So at 24, I guess I was fairly young. Well, you know, it's a funny thing. When you started, I, I, I have to put these on so I can see my security blanket here, okay? <laughs> when you started, you looked so young because you were, as I remember, you were so innocent-eyed and so believing and trustful and everything. It's a long time ago. Yeah, oh, you changed. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, uh, yeah, I remember, and you were absolutely a godsend to me because I was looking so desperately for somebody who could handle all these books mm -hmm. and do this writing and so forth, and uh, it just was as though you were the answer to a prayer. Mm -hmm. Remember, you, you took over the Fantastic Four, you took over the Avengers, the X, I guess you did almost all the stories. Most. And as good as anybody could have wanted, built up your own following. I began to hate you as the fans began to love you. But um, here we are. You know, one thing I've always wondered, Roy, when you were young, most kids, they took up stamp collecting, they got yeah. into electric trains, they read comics, and then after a year or two, they, they went to other things. What made you such a, uh, a real devotee of comic books? Yeah. I think that things just have to hit you at the right age. I don't know. Trains, I couldn't afford to collect trains, for one thing. I always kind of wanted to, you know, but uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, stamp collecting, little tiny pictures. I couldn't get interested in little tiny single shots. But when I was about uh, four and a half years old, or maybe a little younger, um, I was walking with my mother, I, I, I've traced back, uh, through a drugstore in uh, Jackson, Missouri, where I was born. And uh, suddenly I looked up and saw all these colors, you know, and everything. And I said, what's that? <laughs> and, you know, and here were all these characters, uh, Captain America and Superman and Batman and all these great characters. And, and at the age of four, before I could read them, my mother just started reading them to me. I developed a great love for them that's, you know, like totally beyond any kind of comprehension. And the other things, the stamp collecting and all the other things that I had as hobbies, uh, be it chess or collecting records, going to movies, they just never meant as much to me as comics. Yeah. And it's really stayed with you ever yes. since. Yes. You Unlike, say, John Romita, you know, yeah. uh, who was mentioning last week that he gave them up for a while and renounced them. Well, there were yeah. times during the 50s when there was not much happening in comics that I really liked, but there was never a time when over a couple of weeks went by that I didn't buy a comic, uh, whether it was, you know, uh, the Superman and Batman, the few superheroes that were left, or it was Uncle Scrooge, or it was Mad, or it was Archie, if it had yeah. to be. You, you know? even published a, uh, a so-called fanzine mm -hmm. of your own, of course, a fan magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it called? Al Alter Ego. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I That's remember. what got me into the field, basically, yeah. I guess. And uh, just before we get into your getting into the field, because I want to get into that, you had been a school teacher too, hadn't you, Roy? High school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what did you teach? Um, well, I was supposed to teach English. I guess that's what I taught. <laughs> uh, since my majors were history and social <coughs> sciences, naturally I ended up <coughs> teaching English, which was yeah. a, a major. Uh, it was a, mostly 8th, uh, ninth, and 10th grade level in uh, yeah. the St. Louis area for the most part, for about four years. I think it may come as a surprise to some people, uh, fr mostly people who've landed from the moon who yeah. still think of comics as being a little bit further down than they really are on the cultural scale, mm -hmm. that one of our very top people is an ex-school teacher, a high school teacher mm -hmm. of English, and as a matter of fact, we have a number of other people. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see, who is it? We have... Uh, who, uh, you had mentioned somebody just well, earlier. Well, Steve Gerber, Steve who is Gerber, one of the right. main writers. Well, he's an old friend of mine. I've known him since he was in junior high. Yeah. And uh, the uh, major creator of Howard the Duck and a writer for Marvel for the last several years. Uh, he was a high school teacher, I think, of English and so forth yeah. in the St. Louis area for a few years, in addition to being in advertising yeah. and other fields. And our new Canadian uh, A new young Canadian artist is only 23, a guy named Jim Craig, and he's yeah. teaching, including comic book drawing, uh, in a college in Toronto, 
And uh, Marv Wolfman, who uh, is was an editor writer teacher. there, was an art teacher for a year or two. So there are a number of people yeah. uh, there that are teachers. I guess, yeah. I guess we shouldn't dwell on it too much, or people are going to feel that they need a teaching license <laughs> in order to, to come in and do Mar uh, Marvel comics. You don't really have to. It does help to have uh, some sort of an intelligence, though. And now, on that ridiculous note, let me pause for a moment, because I know Roy is desperately waiting to find out all about... John Buscema's Comic Book Workshop. Um, John, whom you know as well as I do, because you write so many of his stories, including Conan the Barbarian, and we'll devote a lot of time to that later. John is teaching artwork in the heart of New York City to young people and older people who feel that they really want to learn how to be comic book artists, and there's even a course in writing. And this is something new, it's very successful, uh, he's had so many applications, and there's one class almost finishing. It's doing beautifully. For those of you who are interested, let me give you uh, the address to contact. Uh, that's John Buscema, Department J, Box 394, East Setauket, New York, 11733. That's not where the class is held. The class is held, as I say, in the heart of Manhattan, but East Setauket is where you can reach John. That's where he opens his mail. Uh, big artists have different places where they open their mail and where they hang up their hat and where they read books uh, because they lead very glamorous lives. And now back to rascally Roy Thomas. I've never lived that name down. <laughs> People keep asking me about that. I think yeah. you probably hated me the first yeah. day that well, I wrote you, that. you experimented around for a while when I first came. There was Rollick and Roy and two or I three like others. I like that too, I must and admit. I made up Roy the boy to, to yeah. understand the man in one place myself, uh, just for the <laughs> heck of it. But. Uh, yeah, Rascally Roy. People remember that, e even though we don't use it quite as much. But I, I find myself using it. Yeah. Even. You know, it's, it's a kind of a... It is a good. Yeah. It's a funny thing about these nicknames. I, I started doing it years ago because I thought it was good promotion and it was good uh, for imagery mm -hmm. to the readers and also because I have such a lousy memory for names. It helped me. We had so many people. It helped me mm -hmm. remember who was who. Let's see. At any rate, then you came to Marvel. And uh, it was rather strange the way you, you got into the business. You didn't come to Marvel first, did you? Well, you were writing th all of the Marvel books, just about, yeah. except the couple that your brother you know, Larry wrote in the Westerns. So I figured, well, you know, Marvel is a closed entity. And I never really applied for a job in comics anyway, but I was sending the fanzine around to people. And suddenly, just after I'd accepted a scholarship to do graduate work, when I was back in St. Louis, two days later, I got this offer to work for National Periodical as the assistant editor of Superman. And I worked for them for oh, two, two whole weeks <laughs> and so forth. Uh, didn't like it a lot. Uh, and uh, I had wanted to, you probably don't even remember this, I had wanted to meet you because I admired your writing. Of course, I was interested in the artwork too, but the, the writing was the main thing. Third say, of course, on. what did I know then? <laughs> so, uh, and I, I, I wrote you a letter asking, why couldn't we get together for a drink sometime? And you ended up uh, indirectly in the next day or two uh, offering me a job about 10 minutes after It was met. easier and cheaper to offer you a job than to buy you a drink. You yeah, know, I guess it was. I guess it was. And I wrote Millie the Model that weekend, and it's been working out okay ever was since. Was Millie the Model the one you started? It, well, it was actually Modeling with Millie, which oh, was the was second book. Funny? I went, I I went home and wrote that over the weekend, and you, know. uh, uh, you didn't like that one a lot. You liked the second one I did, <laughs> the second one, yeah. I think I, I wouldn't have liked anything at first because I used to love Bill. I used to tell myself I'm the only guy who could write this. You book were probably book. right. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's funny. Uh, you don't may not know this, but you walked in like one second after I was saying, "Please send me somebody who could take this load off yeah. our shoulders." Well, nobody that. knew, you, you know, because you know, nobody yeah. knew that you were looking for anyone. Everybody yeah. thought you liked writing all these books all the time. Well, I did, and, but and I mean that you had all the time. No one yeah. could understand. Everybody thought that the letterers were actually writing them because <laughs> nobody could possibly be, be editing a whole line of books and writings, yeah. two or three hundred pages a month. So we figured it was really all ghostwriting. At least a lot of people felt that you uh, signed your name to a lot of things you didn't really do, and it was actually the letter that do, was doing it. It is all. funny. People do think that of people in our business. Mm -hmm. They think, ah, oh, there must be somebody helping them. Now, let's get to the real heavy stuff, Roy Thomas. Yeah. Um, I like to think that my name, for example, is associated with a strip like Spider-Man, you know, or the Hulk, or whatever. In your case, while your name is also associated with many strips, I would have to think that when anybody who thinks of comic books and thinks of Roy Thomas, after they've thought of Millie the Model, yeah. their next thing has to be Conan the Barbarian. So it seems. And um, I have to admit, this is one thing that I can take very little credit for. 
uh, because it seems to me the first time you came to me and suggested doing Conan the Barbarian, my thought was, uh, you know, who's interested in that except maybe Roy Thomas? Mm -hmm. You know, you said it's sword and sorcery, and I said to you, what sword and sorcery? We're still arguing that one. Yeah, yeah. I'm still not quite sure what it is, but I know it's been very successful. What made you decide that was what you wanted to try? Well, basically, uh, one thing that you uh, have forgotten, and I often do too, is that we were getting a lot of letters from readers uh, who were aware that Conan the Barbarian uh, was a series of books that was coming out in the late 60s in paperback form, and it sold two or three million copies yeah. with these beautiful covers by yeah. you know, Frank Frazetta and these stories that were actually written for pulp magazines in the 30s. And uh, I had never read one. I had bought one, I started one, put it aside, but it seemed as if the kind of thing that might just make it in comics, and we needed something different. You know, you can't do endless numbers of superheroes. And um, actually, I think you were about as you know, enthusiastic about it was, as I was. It's just that, uh, you know, we were not sure whether the thing I never could thought it would be so good. Oh, I didn't either. No. I had been <laughs> brainwashed by them, by the readers. I felt if they don't wear costumes and boots, they're not going to sell. Mm -hmm. You remember what happened with the Fantastic Four? In the beginning, we tried to tone down the costumes, and I got all this mail from readers. We love the book. It's great. Everything mm -hmm. is fine, but I'll never read another book if you don't give them costumes. I think I wrote that one. Uh, uh, <laughs> one of those. <laughs> so, I, you're the one who brainwashed me. Mm -hmm. I felt you have to have a superhero mm -hmm. costume. I did, and too. And here's Conan, like mm -hmm. Tarzan, sort of a long cloth. He did have little furry boots as I Often on sandals, yeah. As a matter of fact, I promised you I would try to remember about the painting, and this is a great yeah. lead-in. We even have a painting of a cover of Conan that Roy may want to talk about. Can you get that on the camera uh, clearly enough? It's a really beautiful painting. Who did it, Roy? Well, what was the story? Uh, the painting underneath it, it's really two paintings. The, the underdrawing was done by John Buscema who does the book regularly. The uh, finished painting over that was done by uh, Boris Vallejo, who's a very uh, talented yeah. uh, newcomer in painting in, in recent years. And this is an illustration we did for one of our large dollar Conan magazines. And it's the, the most famous Conan scene from literature. I wish I could say I made this up, but I didn't. <laughs> and it's of Conan. He was crucified by and left to die on the desert by one of his enemies. And I that, remember that story. That yeah. vulture that you're seeing there is about to come down and try to pack out his eyes thinking that he's you know dead or dying and what he does at that stage is he uh, bites the vulture's neck breaks it while it's clawing against him and so forth and kills it you can't have a, a hero very much tougher than that <laughs> you know when you call him Conan the Barbarian you're not ki or I should say when Robert Howard called him mm -hmm. that he wasn't kidding huh? no he wasn't kidding well there is something about Conan I guess he combines the primitive jungle excitement of Tarzan mm -hmm. with a special savagery of his own, plus a great air of fantasy. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fantasy in yeah. those stories. I see our time signal is being given. Roy, while you think of examples of the fantasy, all right, let me talk now about, let's see, we did this one. Someday we're going to have a big enough show that we have somebody else read the commercials. But anyway, here we go. I must admit I like doing the one for Super Snipe especially. So let's talk about the Super Snipe bookshop. Now, as everybody who's into comics knows, Super Snipe is the bookstore for the fan and the collector. Located at 1617 2nd Avenue, New York, near the corner of 84th Street. Uh, it has over 500,000 back issues. It has early delivery of all the new comics, so you never need miss your new books. They sell original artwork. They buy original artwork. Super Snipe buys complete collections, and out of the goodness of their heart, to show how they care about you, they're open from 12 to 6, Monday to Saturday, although apparently they don't care about you on Wednesdays, because that's when Super Snipe is closed. That's the Super Snipe Bookstore, 1617 2nd Avenue, New York, near the corner of 84th Street, and if you desperately want to phone them immediately, it's 879-9628. And now, let's have one more cultural moment as we discuss the origins of Marvel Comics. Now, I don't care how you focus on me, but be sure that this is perfect. Because this was the first in what promises to be a never-ending series of books telling how Marvel Comics got started and also illustrating the stories and the introductions with really magnificent samples, magnificently colored and printed samples of our earliest strips. This became a bestseller within a few weeks and was followed shortly thereafter by Son of Origins of Marvel Comics. 
I might add that a third issue is going on sale in just a few months. It's not called Son-in-Law or Brother-in-Law. It's called Bring on the Bad Guys, telling all about the villains, but you'll hear about that later. At any rate, both the origins of Marvel Comics and Son of Origins, through the benevolence of the publisher, Simon & Schuster, can now be yours if you follow these simple rules. Merely write to Simon & Schuster, Department MD, 630 5th Avenue, New York City, 120. Now that's the origins of Marvel Comics. Deluxe paperback at 695, cloth binding at 1195. Or if you've already bought the Son of Origins, or if you, uh, I'm sorry, the Origins, or if you want to buy them both at the same time, Son of Origins, deluxe paperback 695, cloth binding 1095. And you've had long enough to look at the address. I don't think I ought to repeat it. Okay? Now we go to Roy Thomas, and I, as soon as I get rid of these papers, and I think, Roy, we were just talking about the fantasy in Conan at that particular time. Uh, I never realized that sword and sorcery, which I thought of as just a guy with a sword hacking people to bits and so forth, mm -hmm. I never realized there was so much magic and fantasy and so much of a fairy tale yeah. quality in these yeah. stories. Well, the basic thing is that the uh, man, Robert E. Howard, who invented the character, was trying to sell to this market Weird Tales, which was a magazine back in the 20s and 30s and 40s. and. Uh, in order, he liked to do this heroic adventure with people just hacking away with swords, but they wouldn't buy it. So in order to get them to buy it, he had to bring in monsters. They would fight uh, you know, apes with human intelligence yeah. or, or pterodactyl men or evil wizards mostly, yeah. things of this sort, and then they bought it. And he created a whole little genre of fantasy just because he was trying to make a buck, basically. I, you know? that's, I never knew that. Yeah. Really. He lived down in Texas, you know, yeah. and, and he never even met another writer. Yeah. Probably uh, he wasn't able to be corrupted by others. <laughs> Probably. Let me ask you, uh, isn't there a lot of magic and enchantment in the stories also? There are witches and people who cast spells and that there sort is. of thing? There is. Or to they it just occasional? No, I try to keep it down, though, to about one supernatural thing per issue, for the most part, uh, as a general rule. I see. Simply because... Uh, otherwise, you know, if, you, if everything is magical, the world doesn't yeah. seem real, and you've already got a kind of a strange, medieval, ancient kind of mishmash The world, world. itself seems... Uh, because it's, it's a enough, fictitious huh? time. Yeah that is supposed to be before the fall of Atlantis, which never really, you know, existed anyway. I think that's great. In order for him to be very literal and mm -hmm. very scholarly, and so that historians can follow it, he says, well, it happened before the fall of Atlantis, mm -hmm. as though everybody knows exactly what day Atlantis yeah. fell, if there yeah. indeed was. 10,000 B.C. Yeah, that is funny. You can look it up in your uh, history <laughs> books there. You know, the funny thing is, if I had realized there was as much fantasy in Conan, mm -hmm. I would have been more enthusiastic mm -hmm. about it, because I've learned as far as our readers are concerned, I think the reason Marvel comic superheroes are so popular, I am convinced it's the element of fantasy mm -hmm. that all the stories contain. So now I feel better. I feel that I wasn't really that wrong. Well, you mean that even though it's, it's up to about 70 issues now, you don't, you're not going to cancel it this I'm beginning to think that we've got a winner there. <laughs> Maybe Almost, so. He may be another Howard the Duck. Maybe so. Some, someday we may devote a show to Howard the Duck, but I want to keep you guessing if you don't know what that Wait is. Wait until it gets up to 70 issues. First, okay, right? that's right. After he's proven himself, <laughs> right? Right. Let me ask you something. We had other sword and sorcery characters. Mm -hmm. We had Cole, King right. Cole or Cole the King. Or he was we, many things. Right. Yeah, many now, names. Why do you think Conan was more popular with our readers than all these others, which in many ways were rather similar? Mm -hmm. Do you have a theory for that? Well, nothing to go into you know, too, uh, too briefly, except that Conan is just a better character. It's like, you know, why is Spider-Man better than Daredevil? Good as a character as Daredevil is, Spider-Man's a better one. Uh, Cull is an older character than Conan. You probably yeah. don't know that. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't. Cull was created by the same man and created before Conan. And, and he, and then Roy he, Howard. Robert, Robert Howard, Howard. Yeah. Robert. Right. I'm Roy. I have Roy on the brain. <laughs> but anyway, he, uh, so they're very similar. I think one of the problems is that Cull was um, emphasized as being a king. And I think it's rather dull to be a king. You probably had that trouble when you wrote The Submariner. I know I always did. When you've got a guy who's a king or even a prince that sits on a throne, it's very difficult to make the, the reader feel uh, any empathy with him. Uh, in fact, very the hard to relate yeah. to a king. The Cull book has become very popular, which is why we've recently brought it back, and it's mainly because we've dethroned him, and he's now wandering around the world, killing people and fighting monsters, trying to uh, get back his throne. Do you think some of this has to do with the syndrome that seems to be popular today, where somebody like Columbo mm -hmm. is popular? Uh, in the old days, Humphrey Bogart was popular, mm -hmm. and the rough 
rough-and-tumble characters, mm -hmm. certainly the readers of adventure seem to like somebody like that, rather than somebody who's very wealthy and who's very regal. Mm -hmm. I think people who like adventure probably like to read about a tough slob who's yes. kind of unpredictable yeah. and, and is given to some sort of uh, unexpected violence. And he's real. He's realistic yeah. because he's he, he's uh, he's greedy to a certain extent. He's noble. Yeah. And you have to have a character be noble. You, know, you can't just say, well, he's just in it for the money alone because nobody's interested in that. But over this nobility, he always he, he wants to uh, get paid for anything that he does. Uh, he's more interested in, in uh, women than his horse, unlike, say, cowboy heroes. Sounds like you and me. Exactly like you and me. You know? Maybe that's why our own superheroes uh, uh, were popular after mm -hmm. a while, like Spider-Man, because when you think about it, and the Fantastic mm -hmm. Four, these were characters who also worried about money. Mm -hmm. You know, the old superheroes, you, uh, you never had the feeling they had a bill to pay or anything, you know? Right. They'd worry about, do the girls like them, instead of girls always chasing them around? Right. So. I was asleep at the switch. I should have realized the, realized the similarity sooner. What happened was, I guess I looked at it in a shallow way. I saw a guy wearing a loincloth, and I said to myself, well, why do the readers who like Spider-Man, like Conan, listening to you talk, there's probably much more of a similarity than I thought there There was. is underneath, yes. Yeah. That's why yeah. it fit in so nicely. Yeah. Well, I always said you always taught me a lot while you were yeah, there. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, let me look at the security blanket and see what I've missed. Hey, Roy, one thing that I think is important, mm -hmm. Uh, and usually I ask this of people at the end of the show, there's never enough time to really answer it, but so many young people want to write for comics. And uh, whenever I'm lecturing at a school or somewhere, the one question they ask is, hey Stan, how do I get into comics? How do I become a writer? It's difficult as, as you can imagine, and it's hard to explain. Do you want to just take it easy and explain, if you were a young person now who wanted to write comics, what are the steps, if there are any? Well. I was asked this question a lot most recently at the Marvel convention, and yep. what I had to tell them was is that I'm, I'm not a good person to ask it because I never applied for a job, really, in, in comics. I just sort of drifted into it. But one of the best steps, of course, is a good general education in, in writing, drawing, whatever you happen to want to get into, of course. Uh, the more you know, the more you have to give the job when you finally get into it. Uh, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but as far as the direct steps, I think that uh, the best thing to do is to try to get training through these amateur magazines like I did, the, um, the fanzines, which are magazines published by fans, primarily for fans. Because this is a good way to uh, have your artwork, your writing, and, and it'll be published, it'll be seen by people, you may even build a following and so forth. And the next thing you know, you walk in and, and even the professionals may know who you are. Yeah. Like I was a fan and yet you knew right. vaguely who I was because I'd written these articles for you fan magazines. You bombarded us with that fanzine for years. I but just did three issues. <laughs> but basically it really isn't a case of a guy just knocking on the door mm. and walking in and mm. saying I'd like to be well, a writer. Also with art or with writing, I think a, a very important thing is don't spend all your time imitating comic book writing, don't spend all your time imitating right. that's drawing. In other words, that's the thing. sure, look at, uh, for art, look at Ramita, Kirby, Buscema, and all these guys. For, for writing, look at the stuff that you and I and a lot of other writers you like have done. But also remember that all we're doing is reflecting what we've read and what we've seen. So therefore, you know, learn as much as you can. If you're an artist, learn about anatomy. Perfect. If you're a writer, uh, read as much as you possibly can, yeah. uh, hit, uh, fiction you and nonfiction. As a writer, it's also a good idea, if possible, as Roy said with fanzines, but even in other ways, to build a reputation as a professional writer in another field, mm -hmm. sell stories to other magazines, uh, write a play, write a movie or something, because it's tough to evaluate a person's ability unless we, we see things he's done. And I'm really glad you covered those points. Now we have one more commercial, which is of paramount importance. And all I have to do, it, well, while I'm looking for it, let me show the album cover. It's the Spider-Man album, Rock Reflections of a Superhero. Not a kitty album, a real rock album with pretty good music. Pretty exciting music, I might say. And as an added kick, I have been told, and it says on the back of the cover, that the Incredible Hulk is on drums. Spider-Man is apparently, he's doing something crazy there. Trumpet is the mighty Thor, Black Panther on electric guitar, and so forth. You can't get an album like that anywhere. And let me tell you how to get your rock reflections of a superhero starring Spider-Man. Simply send to Superhero Merchandise, Post Office Box 777, Dover, New Jersey. That's 07801. Now, 
I read it slowly, write it down, because I may not repeat it. And it's a record album, 737. The cassette and the 8-track tape is 837. Both those amounts include postage and handling. That's all you pay. Be sure to print your name and address, city, state, zip code, and age very clearly, and allow four weeks for delivery. We're going to be waiting to hear from you now. And now, back to Roy Thomas. Roy, we just have a minute or so to wrap up. Um, let me ask you this. Do you have any feelings about the future of comics? We know where we are today. Is it a feel that's going to stay the same? Is it going to, are people going to lose interest? Do you think it'll grow? Where do you think I think going? the interest in comics is probably in many ways at an all-time high, uh, especially among the older age groups uh, from the late teens on up through the 20s and 30s and, and even older as more and more people mature who grew up, like myself, reading comic books. Uh, but the, th the problem is, is that, you know, as you know better than I do even, uh, printing costs and things have grown up so much that the regular 32-page comic, I think, is un increasingly untenable. And I think that the, the directions you're going with the, the books, the expensive books, uh, both the reprints and eventually original material and things of this sort, this is the real answer, is a more expensive and therefore even higher quality product in printing and probably in the amount of time and work we can put into it. And that's what I really want to see comics become, to the point where it's sold in bookstores and uh, it's completely legitimatized. We already know that the material is at least reasonably good and has a lot of potential. We just have to convince the rest of the world about it. And we're doing that, I think, slowly and surely. And, and uh, you... We're trying. Yeah, and, and Marvel Comics, as, you know, and I say this as a person who came in four years after it started, uh, you know, it's probably had more to do that with that than anything else. Well, I too would hope that the day will come when uh, our books are sold in hardcover editions and nobody would think there's anything strange or unusual about it. And uh, as for you, you're thinking of moving to the coast, I understand, and you'll still be writing for us, of course, and hopping back and forth and getting your fingers mm -hmm. in movie writing and so forth. Roy, I want to take this opportunity to wish you all the luck in the world. Don't you dare leave us. No. I don't mind you being a few thousand miles away. Don't you dare leave us. And um, the next time you come back to the city, you have to come and visit the old soapbox again and tell us what's happening out on the coast. Okay, right. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Really a pleasure. Bye. As a matter of fact, now that we've done the official ending, I never know when the show really ends. We'll keep talking and they can cut us off whenever they want. Oh, that happens I, to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, <laughs> you going to leave for the coast? Oh, I've, uh, not till the summer sometime. I, I, I just wanted to change the scene for you. It's kind of a nice idea. But...